Good morning. The Prime Minister and the country are waiting for the Sue Gray report, expected within days into the government's lockdown parties. Sadly, we don't know what it says, so instead of more speculation, we're going to look at some of the other pressing matters at hand. Will the tens of thousands of Russian troops massing on the border of Ukraine invade? What can we do about it? And as more and more COVID restrictions begin to be removed across the UK, are we moving too fast? Or is this the beginning of the end of the pandemic? To try and get some answers this morning, I'll be joined by the Deputy Prime Minister and Justice Secretary Dominic Raab. In the latest of our New Year leader interviews by Scotland's First Minister and the leader of the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon. And by the WHO's COVID lead, Dr Maria van Kerkhove. And here to review the news this morning, the Daily Telegraph parliamentary sketch writer Madeleine Grant and the actor David Morrissey. But we begin with the news headlines from Ben Thompson. Sophie, thank you. Good morning. The Foreign Office says it's uncovered a plot by Moscow to install a pro-Russian leader in Ukraine amid increasing tension over a possible invasion. The Kremlin has sent tens of thousands of troops to the Ukrainian border in recent months. Moscow has accused the UK of spreading disinformation. The Conservative MP Nusrat Ghani has said her Muslim faith was given as one of the reasons behind the decision to sack her as a minister two years ago. The Education Secretary, Nadim Zahawi, has called for Ms Ghani's claims to be properly investigated. The Chief Whip, Mark Spencer, has revealed he was the person who spoke to Ms Ghani and insists her accusations are false. Police in the U.S. city of Atlanta say they're following up on a number of leads after the killing of British scientist Matthew Wilson. Mr Wilson had only arrived two days earlier to visit his girlfriend when he was hit by a stray bullet while lying in bed after a number of shots were fired nearby. And finally, it was a moment of British skiing history. Mr Dave Ryder! From the dry slopes of Lancashire to the mountains of Austria, Dave Riding wins Britain's first ever Alpine Skiing World Cup gold medal. That's all the news from me. The next on BBC One is at one o'clock. Sophie, back to you. Thank you very much. Well, now to the papers. And with me to review them this morning are David Morrissey and Madeleine Grant. Let me just show you the uh, front pages before we get to what is actually what is actually in them. Um, I'm, before, I'm going, to, I'm going to show you the Sunday Times, first of all, which is the big story this morning, sacked as a minister because I was a Muslim. This is the Tory MP who was a transport minister who says that she was sacked last year um, with a party whip telling her that she was fired from her ministerial job because of her faith. Plenty of other good stories on the front of the Sunday Times, which we will be covering. The Sunday Telegraph, uh, UK claims Putin is plotting a puppet regime in Ukraine. Also, a lot of coverage this morning about the vaccine deadline for NHS staff, which is set to be pushed back, they say. The Observer, number 10 staff have swipe card data that uh, was logged in probe of the party gate. Lots more uh, details about the Sue Gray investigation, what she might be looking at. The Daily Mail, there's some mail on Sunday this morning focusing on Whitehall and Boris Johnson declaring war on civil servants, refusing to head back to the offices. The Mirror and The Sun both uh, focus their main stories are about Katie Price. Katie faces jail after arrest over text, they say. And the Sunday Express, uh, it's a poll that they have uh, seen which says almost three quarters of Britons think Prince Andrew should be stripped of his Duke of York title. Now, before we get into the papers properly, I'm just going to tell you a bit about the reaction to the Sunday Times front page and the former transport minister, Nusrat Ghani, claiming that she was sacked because her Muslim woman minister status was making colleagues feel uncomfortable. Well, after that story broke last night, MPs from all parties came out to support her, including Conservative colleagues Steve Baker, Mark Harper and Tom Tugendhat, who called for an inquiry, and Labour's Tamanjit Singh Desi. 
Then a cabinet minister joined in Nadim Zahawi, the Secretary of State for Education, tweeted there's no place for Islamophobia or any form of racism in our Conservative Party. Nazgrani is a friend, a colleague and a brilliant parliamentarian. This has to be investigated properly and racism routed out as hashtag stand with Nuz. And not long after that, the government chief whip tweeted to say to ensure other whips are not drawn into this matter, I am identifying myself as the person Nusrat Ghani has made claims about this evening. These accusations are completely false, he said, and I consider them to be defamatory. I have never used those words attributed to me. He then deleted his first thread and reposted with slightly different wording. Well... Lots to talk about, as I said, in the papers. Uh, what is going on? It's a very good question. I mean, we, we use this word far too much in politics nowadays, but when you just take a step back and look at what's just happened, it really is an extraordinary set of events. I mean, I think, as you, as you, as you rightly put it, you know, the, the chain of events in itself is, is, is very odd. But then um, it gets even crazier when Mark Spencer takes to Twitter late in the night when the story breaks. Um, to identify himself as the individual accused of being the source of these claims and also to publicly deny them. Now, obviously, you know, we, we can only speculate so much about this because, you know, it's a serious, serious claim that warrants a proper investigation. But I think it really shows how party discipline has collapsed. And it's really not a good look for a serious government to be conducting these kind of, you know, very worrying allegations on a platform like Twitter and, and responding to them in that way. It suggests a real... Uh, chaos at the heart of the operation that uh, isn't doesn't seem tenable, even if the Prime Minister were to survive a, a no-confidence vote in the coming weeks. And this creates serious problems uh, going down the line because Nusrat Ghani is a very popular MP, but highly respected and an excellent performer in, um, in Parliament. And also we've seen how, um, how a Cabinet Minister, Nadeem Zahawi, has broken ranks to uh, to publicly defend her. So it shows a kind of fractures emerging even within um, cabinet and at the height of government. It does give you a sense of, of the sort of atmosphere at the heart of government at the moment. Another story that you've uh, picked up on another front page of the Sunday Times, the party's inquiry turns its spotlight on Carrie Johnson, the Prime Minister's wife, and her friends. And this is all about what might have been going on in the Prime Minister's flat during lockdown. Yes, that's right. Um, the Sunday Times is also is reporting that... Um, the bad news keeps on, keeps coming for the government that the scope of Sue Gray's investigation could be broadened out to include um, the Prime Minister's wife, uh, following reports that two of her close friends visited the flat that she shares with the Prime Minister during lockdown. And these are friends who um, work as advisers within uh, within government. Um, but I think that there are some question marks raised about, um, you know, why were there no officials present at, um, at, at, at this meeting? If it had been a sort of serious, proper meeting, surely there would have been officials, some are saying. And Sue Gray has been given access to um, a detailed log of staff movements in and out of the security data. And, um, I mean, interestingly, although we obviously can't preempt the, out the, the results of this report, um, it seems that the date in which it's being published has been pushed back a little. We were hearing uh, earlier in the week, and now we're hearing it's more like Thursday, which perhaps doesn't bode too well for the uh, number 10. David Morrissey, you're a Labour Party member. I mean, what do you make of all this? Well, from you know, Labour point of view, it's like shooting fish in a barrel, really, isn't it? It's just sitting back and letting them get on with it. I mean, it, as you said, it's every day there's something new. I mean, I think the party... It's interesting that the uh, review has been pushed back because that just suggests that there's more and more stuff. It's not as straightforward as we thought it was, that Sue Gray is going to be in, uncovering more stuff than we, than we know about it already. So it just feels like it's such a mess. And every day you open the paper and there's another story. But this isn't Keir Starmer, is it? No. Putting forward policies and, and leading the way on that. He's obviously leading the polls. This is just mistakes, that, things that are going on in well, government. You say that the, are the mistakes, benefiting. but they're really, you know, the sort of people flouting the law, you know, making, it, making up their own rules. I think the country is looking at the, the government at the moment and seeing that it's one rule for them and one rule for us. I mean, you know, the Carrie Johnson story today is, you know, it looks like they're just flouting the, the conditions that all of us were told to live under. So it's not policy, but at the moment, 
government. The noise isn't about Labour policy. The noise is about what's going on in the government and, and the mess that we're all in. And, uh, Madeline, more noise about... This is Gavin Williamson, the other story you've picked on the uh, Sunday Times. Gavin Williamson accused over this threat. This is the threat to cancel a new school. This is all about the, the claims of, of blackmail that, uh, that was going on. Yes, um, he's, come, he's come out. It does seem like... Uh, this weekend has seen a lot of, you know, people being publicly named and people sort of showing the receipts for the first time. Christian Wakeford has come out and named Gavin Williamson as the MP that he accused of, of threatening him to cancel a new school in his constituency as, um, as punishment for going against the government. And um, we also expect that on that front, um, William Ragg is going to be talking to the police early next week uh, about similar allegations of, of blackmail against um, Tory MPs who, um, who threatened to oppose the government or send in their letters. You uh, watch this very closely. Do you think this is all going to add up to a, confidence of no, a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister this week? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very boring answer, but I really do think that it depends on the findings of the report, which we're, you know, we're still just speculating about now. Um, and also, I think how a big determiner will be um, how the findings of the report register with MPs. You know, they will, um, I think MPs will be able to decide for themselves if the level of, you know, outraged correspondence that they're getting from their constituents, the kind of reception that they have when they return to their surgeries next Friday. I think these sorts of things will also inform the decision. Um, and I suspect that most will re reserve judgment until that point, because um, despite all the chaos in, in number 10, um, you know, there are still fears that uh, replacing the prime minister could, could you know, create an, an, another power vacuum that could create perhaps even greater chaos. David if that Murphy. is such a thing as possible. David, let's move on to some of the stories that you have uh, picked a rather different flavour. Uh, skiing, should we start with that? Well, uh, yes, so this is the story of uh, Britain's first Alpine Skiing World Cup gold medal. And I think we should just pause about that sentence for a second. It's the you first know, time, I think, in 55 years. In 55 years. I mean, it's unbelievable. And it's uh, Dave Ridings, and uh, he, he won the gold medal. He's, one of, he, I think, the oldest person to ever win it at 35. And he's skiing against, you know, Austrians and Finns and Norwegians. And I know Lancashire can get a bit nippy, but I don't think he <laughs> learned skiing going to school like those guys did. So it's an enormous achievement. I think he's... The pictures of him are just delightful on the front pages. The pages are full. Uh, the papers are full of really worrying and awful stories. And this, I think, is something that is really brilliant to see. And what about the uh, story inside the Times about the cyclists? So this is a story. It's like that story of where what could possibly go wrong. I can't find. It. But it, it's like um, the updated highway code. Isn't cyclists it? have to be yeah. told that what they should do from yeah. now on. Here. Yeah. What they should do from now on is cycle in the middle of the road. I mean, I cycle a lot, and it's always keeping to the left. But we're now being told that in order to be seen, they should be cycling right in the middle of the road. So, I mean, you know, I cycle, and I hear um, motorists beeping their horn at me all the time for no reason. So now that I'm being asked to be in the middle, middle of the road... Middle of the road, or two abreast, just to protect each other. It's going to be crazy. Come <laughs> Um, Derby as well, football, let's yeah. do a bit about that. So Derby County, obviously there's a lot about them. They're just about to go into liquidation, uh, threatened with liquidation. And I know that, um, you know, the, the football is a business. We know that now. But these clubs, Derby, Berry went out of, um, out of uh, circulation, went out of, out of business recently. And they're at the heart of their communities. And so the law has to be changed, I think. There's something has to be looked at that these because it's only the supporters in the end who are going to, uh, you know, suffer. And I think the law has to be looked at about how the, it is mismanagement, but how they can be protected to keep them at the heart of their community. They're much more than football clubs. It's not a football story. And I think we just need to highlight that a, a, a bit in today. And, Madeleine, we've got the, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister coming in. Uh, we were talking to him about this, but lots of coverage this morning about Ukraine. And uh, these claims from the UK that... Putin is planning to invade and put in a puppet regime in Ukraine. Yes, that's right. Um, we report that the Foreign Secretary took what was actually quite an unusual step of publicly releasing specially declassified intelligence, naming a former Ukrainian MP called Yevgeny Muriev um, as, the, as the Kremlin's preferred candidate to take over the country um, following an invasion and to be installed as a puppet leader 
um, thereafter. And um, he is the leader of a small pro-Russian party, which currently has no seats in the Ukrainian parliament. Um, and he's denied the, the claims already. But um, to be honest, despite all the chaos that we've just been talking about in number 10 at the moment, the government's robust response to Ukraine, I think, is, is one of the few areas where you get a sense of genuine resolve and genuine strategic thinking at the heart of what they're doing, um, especially when you compare it to some of the um, dithering and quite contradictory pronouncements we've been hearing from some of our other allies. So I think the, what the FCO says about this should be taken very seriously. And uh, David, let's just talk quickly about Leslie Manville, who's in the papers telling, uh, telling young people to be quiet in the theatre. You know her very well, not least because you've just been in a or you're filming, or you've been yeah, filming yeah, in a new BBC been, drama. I've just been doing a drama with her called Show It. She's a wonderful actress, and there's a great interview with her in the U magazine. Uh, yeah, and she does talk about... Uh, she was in the theatre, and uh, there was quite a rowdy bunch of kids, and she went up and confronted them, thank goodness. I mean, I was in the theatre myself last night, and audiences are getting up and down and walking and getting their phones out. It really is uh, something that we need to sort of grab hold of really but this uh, this interview is wonderful she talks about her life she's someone we should really celebrate she's wonderful and she talks about trying to get to the oscars which is when you think about stress this <laughs> her story around that is quite wonderful well david morrissey and madeline grant thank you both very much for joining me to look at the papers this morning joining me right now on a really rather gray day i can see outside from our studio here louise lear what have you got in store for us louise well, you've pretty much summed it up, actually, Sophie. A lot of grey. It's a bit of a drab Sunday out there. A lot of dry weather, though, I'm pleased to say. Not that much in the way of significant rain to come over the next few days. But Carmarthenshire sums it up, really. Leaden-looking skies. But it's dry. You can get out on the beach. You can get out and have a walk today. As the high pressure drifts off into the near continent and the feeds coming in from the southwest from the Atlantic, so it's dragging this cloud of moisture with it. There is a weather front trying to push in, but it's going to take all day and most of the the evening before it arrives but it will bring some strengthening winds gusting to gale force and ahead of it a little bit of drizzle into western scotland elsewhere there'll be glimpses of sunshine from time to time but with very light winds further south there is nothing really to stir up that cloud to break it up really so we keep the cloud and if that happens in one or two spots it will stay on the cool side with temperatures around five degrees but we're likely to see highest values this afternoon of nine celsius now as we go through the evening the high pressure continues to drift off steadily eastward. So as we move into Monday, that weather front will be sitting into the far northwest. Not that much in the way of rain with it either. A very weak affair. We keep quite a lot of cloud as we go through the next few days. More significant rain potentially on Wednesday. And then it might get a little sunnier and a little warmer. Sophie. Thank goodness for that, Louise. Thank you very much. Well, the Prime Minister said this week that it is time to learn to live with the virus. All Plan B measures to stop the spread of coronavirus are being removed from Thursday in England. Some of the tighter restrictions in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland are also being eased. And Boris Johnson says the government intends to completely end self-isolation rules for people with COVID in the coming weeks. I've been speaking to the World Health Organization's COVID-19 expert, Dr Maria van Kerkhove. You know, so I, you know, we're very much in the middle of it. I know everyone is ready to be done with it. I am as well. Um, but this virus is still evolving. It's still changing. And we need to, we need to change with it. So what we are thinking is how we adjust, you know, into this third year. What are we going to do in terms of increasing vaccination coverage around the world, but at the same time, drive transmission down? Um, it will not end with this latest wave with Omicron, and it will not be the last variant that you will hear us speaking about, unfortunately. Omicron swept through the UK relatively early. It does feel to a lot of people, like we're out of this now. Would you agree? Well, you may be out of the latest wave of Omicron, uh, and certainly many countries like the United Kingdom, you know, that has high population level immunity from infection as well as high vaccination coverage. Um, you know, you will see a difference, a difference, you know, as we move forward, you're in a different stage of this pandemic. But you have to remember, out of the 10, almost 10 billion doses of vaccines, that have been administered to date, there are still more than 3 billion people around the world who have not even received their first dose. So we still have a highly susceptible population. And even if there are some countries that are further along, let's say, um, in this pandemic, the rest of the world is very much still in it. So we, and because this is a global problem, we have to treat it with global solutions. Um, so I think, you know, I think we have a ways to go. We cannot forget that the virus is still evolving and I, and there will be more variants. There is this narrative out there that Omicron is mild. 
Um, Omicron is not mild. It is less severe than Delta, but is still putting people in hospital, in particular those who are not vaccinated, those with underlying conditions, those of advanced age. But because the virus is circulating so intensely around the world, this puts pressure on the virus to change. Um, there's a suggestion that Omicron will be the last, and that's just not true. And there's also the suggestion that future variants will be less severe, and that's not a certainty. So we expect more variants to emerge, which will be more fit, if you will. They will be more transmissible because they will have to overtake whatever variant is circulating, in this case, Omicron. But there's no guarantee that the next one will be less severe. It's possible that it could be even more severe, um, and it may have properties, more properties of immune escape, which will render our uh, countermeasures less effective. So we have to still treat this virus with the seriousness that it has. Um, and again, there's so many tools that are worldwide that, that can be in use, vaccination, the use of masks, distancing. We still need to, us, put pressure on this virus to not allow it to spread. We can't give it a free ride. Given that by the end of March, half of the world is expected to have been infected with Omicron, around half of the world is vaccinated. Surely we are building up a resistance to any new variant. Doesn't it eventually become just like a, a bad flu? Um, I would push back against calling this a bad flu. Um, this is a very different virus and it's evolving differently than influenza, you know, in the sense where we have a lead time in terms of our ability to develop the vaccines and make these educated guesses about how the vaccine composition should be for influenza so that we can prepare. This virus is not giving us that opportunity. Yet in England this week on Thursday, most measures are being removed. From your point of view, is that too soon? I think it's quite soon. Um, again, with the factors that I've just outlined, you know, this virus is spreading really intensely. I think what is the challenge as we move into this next phase of this pandemic is how do we get the balance right with the measures that are needed to reduce the spread? Um, masks are widely available now. They were not in the beginning of this pandemic. We are asking people to be very cautious for the moment. This pandemic will end. We will not be in this cycle forever. How long could that take? Years or months? I'm not talking months, um, because if we look at a global level, we can't be out of the woods in one country while the rest of the world still suffers. The WHO advice is to keep some measures in place for the foreseeable future. Masks, working from home where possible, for example. But, but that does have costs, doesn't it? Advising people to work from home clearly has an impact on economies. Yeah, it's not everybody working from home. I mean, I think in this pandemic, we have seen that there are many businesses um, and where people can function very uh, adequately at home um, with, with the world that we live in now with all of the different types of electronic platforms to speak to one another. What There are some who can't work from home. There are people around the world who have day wages. They have to go to work. They have to be able to put food on the table. What we're saying is that in situations where there is pressure on your systems because of the circulation of this virus, that you use a balanced approach. But you're basically asking people to change their way of life for the foreseeable future. There's not really an end in sight to this. On the basis that something more might happen, do you understand why people think that that is too much to ask? I do understand, and I do understand people's frustrations, but we will not be in this situation forever. Um, and wearing of a mask um, is not a big ask. What we are saying is that we need to be cautious. We need to exit this pandemic. We're not out of the woods yet. We need to exit this gracefully and carefully and slowly. We are not out of it. People do want to see an end to this, don't they? So just give people an idea of the time scale. Do you envisage people wearing masks for the next few months, for the next few years? It depends. I can't give you an answer to that because the situation is so dynamic worldwide. Governments have to set those policies based on the situations that they have. We will be in this pandemic certainly throughout 2022. There's no question in my mind. This virus is moving towards an endemic state at a global level, but you can't reach an endemic state in one country while the pandemic is, is thriving elsewhere. But it will be certainly through this year. We will have to see what happens into 2023, but that doesn't mean forever. Um, and I am curious to see how we will use masks going forward in terms of different flu seasons. You look at Omicron and how highly infectious it is. Have we learned that nothing other than a complete lockdown, a draconian lockdown, can actually stop it spreading? 
So I, I counter that. Um, the goal is not to stop the spread, all spread. The goal is to reduce the spread so that we take the pressure off of health systems. You saw those massive peaks, which we're still seeing in countries, that massive peak overwhelmed systems worldwide. And it is still overwhelming systems worldwide. What we are saying are use tools that reduce the spread. We're not able to stop the spread. We're not able to stop all transmission. Eradicating this virus, eliminating this virus is not possible. But what we can do is we can reduce the spread so that we, we reduce that pressure on the systems. That's the goal. We're just rolling out, as it were, of a winter where we've had very high cases. Are we going to be rolling into another winter at the end of this year, a similar winter? We may. Um, but what we've seen with all of the five variants of concern is that they haven't followed that typical seasonal pattern. Um, and so what we are worried about uh, is the next variant. We are tracking um, descendant lineages of Omicron at the moment. We have this BA.1, BA.2, BA.3. We have 30 sublineages of Delta that we are tracking worldwide. The virus is still evolving. Um, and so we may have future variants, but they won't, th this virus is not behaving like a typical seasonal respiratory virus. It will thrive in any climate, in any situation, if we allow it. It's the variants of concern that circulate. It's the increasing social mixing. It's the inappropriate use of public health and social measures. It's in the context of still susceptible people worldwide. And it's in the context of conflicting messages, misinformation, disinformation, and now these false narratives these false narratives that it's over. Unfortunately, it's not. I would give nothing to be on your show to say we're at the end, but we aren't. And we need everyone's help to get us closer to the end. There's even talk of removing the need to self-isolate if you test positive for COVID in the coming months, by the end of March, possibly, maybe even sooner than that. Certainly in England, would you support that? I think it's premature. I mean, I think there needs to be a clear reason of why that is being dropped. Um, if you don't isolate cases, then the virus will spread between people. Um, our goal uh, with our guidance is to prevent the onward spread. That is why we continue to recommend isolation. Um, and as I said, there can be a balance to shortening that, but completely abandoning that will allow the virus to spread. It sounds as if it alarms you. It does, yes, um, because what we are trying to do, what me and my colleagues here at WHO and around the world, the scientists around the world, we are all working towards ending this pandemic and we need everyone's help. We need everyone to play their part in whatever function they have where they live. Um, and isolation and, and quarantine um, play a really critical role in, in driving that transmission down. Maria Van Kerkhoff, thank you. Thank you for having me. More than 100,000 Russian troops amassed on the border with Ukraine. President Putin says he is not planning to invade, but to put it mildly, many Western countries simply don't believe him. What would the UK and our allies do if it did happen? Well, the Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab is with me now. Why are 100,000 Russian troops on that border? Good morning. Well, look, a very good question. And there's no legitimate explanation for it other than aggressive intent. What we're doing, working with our allies, is making clear that there will be very significant economic consequences if Russia takes that step. Uh, we're also providing uh, moral diplomatic uh, support to the Ukrainians, but also being clear that we stand with them on their right to defend themselves. Uh, and Ukraine is not a NATO ally, but it's a free country within the international community. It has the right to defend itself, the right not to be subject to that kind of intimidation. And of course, what we want, and the reason the Foreign Secretary, uh, in the statement that she's made over the last 24 hours, is being clear about this, is we want, first of all, allies, European across NATO, to understand the seriousness of what's going on. We also want Putin to step back from the brink. So what do you do if Russia does invade? Because that's what the Foreign Secretary says, that the plan appears to be that Russia would put in a, a puppet leader, that they would cross the border and put in a new leader in Kiev. Well, it's totally unacceptable, contrary to international law. The international community as a whole needs to step up to the plate. So one of the things you're seeing, and the Foreign Secretary, I think, is doing a, a very good job of this, is uh, making it clear what's at stake so other countries come and support. Uh, the, the reality is... But is that what you're expecting to happen, an invasion? I think there's a very significant risk of it. And uh, we need to be clear, the world needs to keep its eye on this and be very clear with uh, President Putin that it would not do this cost-free that there will be a price.
price. The price in terms of the the the, the, the strenuous defence that we would expect the Ukrainians to put up, would, uh, but would, also the economic costs through sanctions, which are of course more effective. If the international community speaks as one, or at least with a broad consensus. Would you send British troops to help defend Ukraine? I think it's unlikely. I mean, Ukraine's not a NATO ally. Uh, we have uh, been clear, it's, but of course it's a, a friendly country, a partner of the UK and many other countries around the world. Unlikely, but you're not ruling that out? Well, I think it would be uh, very unlikely, but of course it, it, you need to see... But you're not the... ruling it out, are you? No, I, th I, think, I, I think it's extremely unlikely. Um, but that doesn't mean that we won't do everything that we can short of that to shore up and strengthen the position of Ukraine in taking defensive measures and also to be clear that there would be a very severe economic price to pay. And that is something most effectively done through NATO with our European uh, and transatlantic But allies. are sanctions going to be enough to work? I mean, the president of Ukraine himself says once you introduce even powerful sanctions, they will look at you and say, listen, we can deal with this. We can, can continue as it was. Sanctions are not going to work, are they? Well, I think they do uh, require not just Putin but those around him to stop and think. I think, frankly, bluntly, the two things that Vladimir Putin will worry about is does he get bogged down in Ukraine? Uh, what, are, what kind of fight gets put up? Does, you he, think does he end up with? Does he end up? Sorry, if I may say, does he end up with another Chechnya? I think that is something that influences not just him but those bankrolling him around him. He, President Putin has a hundred thousand troops massed on the border. Do you think he's really in a position or really in the mood to sort of stop and think just at the threat of sanctions? Well. And it's not just that. It is, as I said, the first point is, does he get bogged down in Chechnya Mark II? The second thing is, uh, and this is not just relevant for him personally, but those around, what is the economic price of the new pariah status that Russia would acquire if it proceeds? So I think on those two things, we need to be absolutely aligned with our transatlantic allies. Uh, and of course, what we want, and we want to signal this as clearly as possible, is for, for Putin to step back from the brink. Is the Defence Secretary Ben Wallace actually going to go to Moscow to meet his counterpart, and if so, when? I, I can't give you the precise details, but it is, is right. Is he going to go? It, it is right to say. Is he going to go? So I, I, I can't. I can't tell you. I, I'm, I'm not uh, privy to the precise um, plans for the foreseeable future. But what I can tell you is, it's absolutely right that the foreign secretary, the defence secretary, engage directly. Um, with Russia. We, we want to have a constructive relationship with Russia. But since 2018 and the, uh, the, the nerve agent attack that we had in Salisbury, uh, Russia has engaged in a whole range of nefarious activity. Russia, is a permanent member of the UN Security Council, needs to live up to the basic tenets of international law. And invading another country is not one of those. And the chief of the defence staff says a Russian invasion is the be biggest threat to Europe since World War II. Do you agree? Well, look, at, uh, you could look at Yugoslavia and you could look at other challenges, but I think a wholesale investigation does create that level of risk. And we need to be very clear in talking with our European allies, particularly those, and there are different views, there always are, are across Europe, um, but we stand very firmly and squarely with the Nordic countries, the Baltic countries, who are taking this risk very seriously and want to see the maximum signals telegraphed about the cost uh, that Russia and Putin would incur if they take this, what would be a disastrous step. And we believe it would be disastrous for Russia let alone for Ukraine and Europe. The United States has already told non-essential embassy staff to evacuate. Is the UK going to do the same? Well, the Foreign Office will, as foreign, former Foreign Secretary, I know the Foreign Office will give that travel advice in the normal way and people should keep an eye on it. Let me talk to you about the story that is dominating uh, some of the newspapers today. The former Transport Minister, Nusrat Ghani, who was a Transport Minister until last year. She says that she was sacked as a minister because her Muslim woman minister status was making colleagues feel uncomfortable. Did that happen or did it not? Well, first of all, um, it's a very serious allegation, a very serious claim, and we take it very seriously. There can be no uh, discrimination, Islamophobia or, or any other kind of discrimination in the Conservative Party. Um, <clears throat> the chief whippers overnight made it clear that the allegation is in relation to him, this is Mark Spencer, and he categorically has denied it in what can only be described as the most strenuous terms. What we would say and what I would say is that if there's any, ever any complaint like this, particularly one as serious as this, a formal complaint should be made and it would then be investigated. And uh, the, this relates back to 2020 and all I would just say as a matter of fact, no formal complaint has be made. But we take this incredibly seriously. The allegations that she's making are very, very serious. I mean, she says, I was told at the reshuffle meeting in Downing Street, Muslimness was raised as an issue. My Muslim woman minister status was making colleagues uncomfortable. There were concerns that I wasn't loyal to the parties. I didn't do enough to defend the party against Islamophobia allegations. 
Look, very serious uh, uh, points being made, uh, claims being made. But all I can say is, first of all, the chief whip has come out publicly. I mean, it's quite extraordinary in my time in politics to see him come out and say, actually, this is a conversation that was had with me and it is categorically untrue and indeed defamatory. And at the same time, you've got Nadim Zahawi, who's come out and said that this needs to be investigated properly. And, and I think that's right. And we all feel moral support for anyone who has been uh, subject to any kind of discriminatory treatment. But I think uh, and Nadim is Right, but of course, what the chief whip is saying is that uh, uh, Nuz was uh, invited to make a formal complaint, and that is the way it will be investigated. And she has not made a formal complaint. So, do you, complaint. do you think why would she why would she make it up then? I mean, if I it has not happened, I can't answer that. All I'm trying to give you uh, a very clear account of what the chief whip has said in response, and also critically, the mechanism to make sure any serious allegation like this can and should be. And we would invite, and I would say, if Nuz uh, wishes to do so, she should make a formal complaint so it can be properly investigated. And, and in fairness, the chief whip made that point to her back in 2020. Should this should there be an investigation into this because it is very clear that nobody quite knows what has happened and yeah, what hasn't. And, and, and that's right and the, these things should never just be played out in this so way. So should there be the investigation? Media. Well, well I, I believe actions, a claim like this, as serious as this, should but it can only happen if the person making the complaint makes a formal uh, makes it formally, that's when the procedures kick in. And just to be clear about this, that uh, advice was given to Nuz back in 2020. What does it say about the attitudes in the Conservative Party? Do you recognise this? Do you know what? I don't. We had the Singh review conducted by Professor Singh into Islamophobia, found no systemic um, issues with this. And but that review found that anti-Muslim sentiment remains a problem within the party. And it's precisely because we take it so seriously, we conducted that review. Uh, it did say that there was no uh, syste systematic uh, uh, Islamophobia, but it's precisely because we wanted to take this seriously, and we continue to do so, and I do personally, that we held that. And that's why we've got a mechanism. If there's ever a complaint of this magnitude, and I think take it very seriously, a formal complaint should be made. So you're not going to investigate unless she launches a formal complaint? I think in, I, I think if I look professionally, I don't know how it works in the BBC, but I, but I think I look across the board, it would be very difficult to conduct such an investigation unless it is done with the support and the initiation of the of the individual concerned. I mean, that's I think in most walks of life that would be true. Do you think she should make a formal claim? I mean, there's a well, huge I, amount I, of detail in the papers today. She'll be under a lot of pressure today. today, and I feel for her, um, and I know her and have worked she with her in the past. She already says in the paper today that she feels isolated on of course. this. And that she has questioned whether or not she should remain within the party. Uh, surely, she are you encouraging her to come forward and speak openly? Well, then? I think if she feels able to, she should put in a formal And then complaint. it would be investigated properly? Correct. OK. Uh, let's move forward to the end of next week. Yes. Could you be Prime Minister? No, the... Um uh, it's a kind offer, Sophie, but uh, no. Look, the, the reality is Sue Gray will report on the issues around um, uh, Number 10. We take them very seriously, understand the frustration people feel, um, but it's right that they're investigated uh, by um, Sue Gray properly and that there's that due process and transparency. I would also say that amidst all of this, we had two big things this week. Um, the success of the vaccine booster rollout. Well, I think it's fair because Absolutely, people are saying no, that the government has lost its way. And on the two biggest issues facing the country, and I think people across the country, the booster, the, the, the vaccine booster uh, rollout is at such a level that not only have okay. we protected the country, but we can you, come what, out, what we can come out of lockdown we and have, we have the fastest growing economy no, in the we, And we know that and you have told us well, repeatedly. Well, actually, we, we haven't got a lot of time to explain we want those to points, know, and I think it's fair. We've talked a lot about the booster booster campaign. Um, what we want to know and what people do want to know, we've got Sue Gray's report yep. expected this week. Are you preparing for a vote of no confidence? Look, the, I can tell you this week, uh, with everything that's gone on, uh, I was at Prime Minister's questions, I think there was, uh, particularly with what Christian Wakeford did, there was a rallying of support behind the Prime Minister. Uh, you could feel it in the chamber. And I think the reason is because the booster campaign has been so successful. We're coming out of the lockdown measures. We're moving from Plan B, uh, opening up the economy. We've got the fastest growing economy in the G7. Are you preparing? Wages are rising. Unemployment is coming down. And these are all because of the calls the Prime Minister made. And actually, if you look Look at both of those. Vaccines, if we'd have listened to Keir Starmer, we'd be pegged to the EU scheme. We wouldn't have had the success we've had. If we'd have listened to him in July, he said coming out of lockdown was reckless. Actually, we wouldn't have unemployment going down, wages rising. And still, On the big and still, calls, and st this Prime Minister has got it right. OK, but it is uh, his position has never been quite so perilous in the whole of his leadership. Sue Gray's report comes out this week. Are you going to publish it in full? 
the, uh, the uh, quite the the way uh, the process for it um, will be for the Prime Minister to decide. But he is being clear. It needs to be published he, in full, doesn't it, being, for people to see what the, the actual findings, facts were. The, the, the substance of the findings will be there'll be full transparency. Indeed, he has said he'll come back to the House of Commons and make a statement. So there'll be full scrutiny. But so there will we will get to see the report. I'm not full. quite sure the shape and the form it will come, but the Prime Minister is being clear. There'll be full transparency around this, uh, so that people can see. And and, and actually, I think um, uh, we would welcome that transparency. We need to learn the lessons. The Prime Minister has already said that. The inquiry that Sue Gray's carried out seems to have been uh, expanding all the time. The latest uh, that is reported today, were parties held in the Prime Minister's flat during lockdown? Sophie, you know that the whole point of Sue Gray conducting this investigation is that she can look without fear or favour whatever she wants to look at and we avoid trial by media or the soap opera of things coming out without uh, uh, being substantiated and us uh, speculating on them. What I would say is in relation to any of this, it's significant, it's important, Sue Gray should look at it and she'll be coming back reasonably soon, people get those answers. And if the Prime Minister was having parties in his flat during lockdown, should he resign? You know, Sophie, that I will not respond to these hypothetical questions. Well, but it's if, not hypothetical, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's fact-finding. And but you if, said if, if, so if I think, he it, mis I think he you mis think it's hypothetical. I, I haven't seen the facts yet, Sue well, Gray so is nor, establishing nor, nor them, but I. I'm just asking you, if he is found to have been having parties during lockdown in his flat, should he resign? Look, we've been clear, the Ministerial Code of Conduct is uh, there for everyone, including the Prime Minister, but uh, all of these snippets, as you said, the facts are there for Sue Gray to determine. I want her to do so without fear or favour. There'll be full transparency and accountability for what follows. That's right, and that's the proper way of doing it. But if he is found to have misled Parliament, he will have to resign. Well, the Code of Conduct for Ministers is very clear that if you mislead Parliament, it's a resigning matter. So you expect well, that not, to happen? I, look, I'm absolutely full square behind what the, the Code of Conduct for Ministers is, is there to do. Absolutely. We need integrity uh, in public office and it's, that's what it's there for. And that's in fairness why the Prime Minister has asked Sue Gray to look at these things without fear or favour. If it takes a day or two longer, absolutely right. Sue Gray should determine that. And then we'll get all of the answers that you and uh, other people in the media and, and indeed in the country want to hear. But that will be done properly rather than snippets here or there, claims and counterclaims here or there in the media. How many MPs have you called around to, uh, to rally support for the Prime Minister over the weekend? None. Uh, None at all? No. And, uh, but what I have been doing is getting on with the business of uh, getting the courts back up and running, particularly the Crown Court, getting the backlog down. We've had this uh, Police Crime Sentencing Courts Bill go through the House of Commons. Again, on the big issues, we've called for tougher sentencing. This is what I've been dealing with, which is what you asked me, for serious uh, violent and sexual offenders. Keith Starmer uh, and the Labour Party voted against that. Again, we come back to this crucial issue. On the big issues of the day, uh, Keir Starmer has shown weak leadership. The Prime Minister has shown strong leadership. That's what I've been focusing on. Um, let me focus on a deadline that is uh, approaching fast. Ten days' time, NHS staff who have not yet been vaccinated need to have had their first vaccine, yeah. otherwise they will be moved or lose their jobs. There are about 80,000 of them, and we quite clearly need staff in England uh, in the NHS. What should happen? Can, will you move that deadline? Is it just time to rethink it? Well, look, actually, nine out of ten NHS staff have now come forward and had their vaccine. That's yes, critically that's, important. That's tens of thousands. That's 80,000 who may leave. Sure, but I'm saying that the overwhelming majority now responded, come forward. I do think we continue to call for those to come forward to be boosted uh, or vaccinated uh, uh, before the deadline. But I think ultimately we've got to make sure that uh, we don't have people putting patients at risk um, if they're not vaccinated. And of course, we've got the contingency plans in place, uh, almost 5,000. Uh, so are you sorry, saying just that to, you if I could. Not, but will you not change the deadline? So no, the, anybody the, the, the who has not been vaccinated needs to, to have it done by the 3rd of February? Yeah, the deadline's there to protect the most vulnerable in our hospitals, but we've got the resilience because we've got nearly 5,000 more doctors, nearly 11,000 more nurses than we did in 2020. So the resilience of the NHS is there. But, it, but, it, but ultimately, it must be right to protect those most at risk in the most vulnerable environments, and that, that must mean in hospitals. Dominic Ruff, thank you very much for joining nice me. Now, tomorrow, Scotland is removing most of its remaining coronavirus restrictions. Nightclubs will open, but secondary school children will still be expected to wear masks in the classroom. Scotland has been slower to ease COVID regulations, and until the 6th of January, you still had to self-isolate for the full 10 days if you were a close contact of someone with COVID. The leader of the SNP and the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, joins me now from Glasgow. Good morning and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, has England removed its measures too quickly?
that's a judgment the UK government has to take for England. It's not for me to second guess that judgment. I'm responsible for and indeed accountable for the decisions we make around the handling of the pandemic here in Scotland. Uh, we have all along in Scotland opted to take what I would describe uh, as a responsible and cautious path through this pandemic. Everybody wants to get back to normal. I desperately want the country to get back to full normality, but we have learned through bitter experience that this virus is unpredictable and we need to treat it with care and that's what we are seeking to do. Tomorrow is a big step back to normality for us and hopefully we'll be able to achieve that without seeing a resurgence of infection in the weeks to come. And in Scotland you've had much tighter restrictions, England just had plan B measures. In Scotland you've had much tighter restrictions, yet last week one in 20 people in England had Covid and one in 20 people in Scotland had COVID. Were the restrictions worth it? Uh, yes, I think they were. Um, I, I should say that Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland were broadly um, in the same place and took broadly the same approach. England took a different approach as it was entitled to do. Uh, if you look at the ONS survey, that one in 20 uh, which uh, you cited, um, in terms of the detail of that, around five and a half percent of the population in England had the virus or were estimated to have the virus in that week. It was around four and a half percent in Scotland. So that is uh, a difference. Um, and overall, throughout this pandemic, levels of infection have been uh, lower in Scotland. At times they've been higher, but overall but they have still, been lower. It's still one in 20, though, Scotland... isn't it? It's not. I'm just asking you because sure. obviously the restrictions have yeah. a, a big impact on people's lives. I'm just asking you whether they were worth it. Of course. So that, that's the point I was going to come on and address. And the short answer to that is yes, I think they were, although yes, they uh, have a big impact on businesses and individuals. Uh, what I was going to say is that while I understand the Scotland-England comparison, it's not, in my view, the most important one. The, the most important comparison is, is Scotland in a better position now than we were previously? And are we in a better position than we would have been without these restrictions? Now, it's, it's always difficult in any country to absolutely prove cause and effect in the handling of a virus. But if you look at what we were predicting through our modelling, it would be the case in January uh, before Christmas, what we were on track for, it was around 50,000 infections a day. And we didn't see that materialise or anything like that materialise. And I think that was a combination of the acceleration of the booster campaign. Scotland is the most vaccinated part of the UK in terms of first, second, third and booster doses. Uh, these sensible, balanced, protective measures we introduced before Christmas and lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the magnificent responsible response of the public and who it has had changed their behaviour in the face of Omicron in order to try to stem transmission. So yes, I think what we did has been worth it and uh, we are hopefully now uh, seeing Scotland, as other parts of the UK, very firmly on the downward slope the, of that Omicron the wave. Head of, the head of UK hospitality in Scotland said that the restrictions coupled with health messaging over Christmas and Hogmanay were incredibly damaging for businesses already carrying unsustainable levels of debt. Did those restrictions make enough of a difference to justify that? Uh, yes, I think they did. Uh, but that's not me saying I don't understand and agree that those measures uh, had a, a very adverse effect on businesses. And hospitality right throughout the pandemic has been one of the, the worst hit sectors for reasons I think everybody understands. But I think we've got to, and I know how hard it is for uh, people in business uh, to accept what I'm about to say, but it's not a case of having protective measures and businesses are damaged or having no protective measures and everything is fine. It is the difference between having protective measures that stem transmission, which I think these did, or allowing transmission to go completely uncontrolled, in which case the impact on business is even greater and even more damaging. Did the, did the Living vaccine... with this pandemic for no, any country is, is not perfect, but that's an understatement. Uh, but we have to navigate our way through it as sensibly and as cautiously and as carefully as we can. And that's what we will continue to do. Do the vaccine passports that you're keeping in place, do they actually work in terms of reducing transmission? 
Well, again, I, I will inject, in, in the interest of frankness, my caveat from earlier on, it is very difficult when you're dealing with an infectious virus to be 100% certain about measure A leading uh, to effect B. But yes, I do think they help us as a package of measures protect against transmission. So what they do uh, is ensure that in some of the highest risk settings, if the majority of people are vaccinated, then that doesn't eradicate uh, the chances of an outbreak, but it reduces the chances of an outbreak in these settings. And secondly, and really importantly, because we know the biggest power of the vaccines is in reducing serious illness and death. If you then do have an outbreak in one of these higher risk settings, uh, then you are reducing the number of people, if they are vaccinated, who are likely to become very seriously ill. And that also then reduces the pressure that such an outbreak might then have on our national health service. But the, the, so the evidence from looking at any single measure alone uh, doesn't uh, tell you that it is entirely responsible for containing the virus. It's a package of measures. And of course, if you look across Europe right now, uh, many, many countries have COVID certification schemes in place and many countries have them in place in a much wider spread of venues than is the case here in Scotland. And of course, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have all chosen to do this. And we talk about, uh, often when we're in Scotland, and I'm sure it feels the same in Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, we feel as if we are being uh, described as somehow doing things unique. Uh, and because England hasn't done them, we are the outlier. And I'm saying this not pejoratively, just as a statement of fact. In many of these cases, it's actually England that's the outlier, not just in a UK context, but in a European context. Scotland, but, Wales and Northern Ireland are actually following the path that many European countries but, are but also that, taking. But I'm just talking about vaccine passports, though, because... Uh one of those, the impact that those has had, they have had, Gavin Stevenson from the Nighttime Industries Association says that they've had devastating consequences for a substantial proportion of businesses. And your government's own evidence on the scheme says it doesn't, says it doesn't say it reduces transmission, says there was only a very slight increase in vaccine uptake because of them. Well, look, Scotland right now is the most vaccinated part of the UK. Our vaccine rates are higher than all of the other three UK nations, although all are high uh, in terms of first, second, third and booster doses. So, you know, we've had real success in that. Um, I don't underplay the impact of any of these measures on businesses. But if you take nightclubs, the nighttime industry, checking people's COVID certification, uh, I think is a better alternative to these places being closed. It, it means that they're open uh, as of tomorrow and, and trading again. And, and nightclubs, it's a long, long time since I was in a nightclub, Sophie, but you know, checks for different things that are not unheard of. We have big sporting events uh, which have been able to have spectators in again uh, for the last number of days, checking uh, COVID passes, uh, and that is not causing anybody any real well, hardship Scottish, and, and many the of the concerns and itself, fears we the, had about... The Scottish Government's evidence itself says business organisations have reported negative economic consequences in terms of footfall and revenues, along with staffing difficulties because of them. Are you going to bring COVID passports to an end or not? Well, eventually, yes, I hope. But, uh, When's and, eventually? Uh, more than hope. Of course they will come to... Well, look, Sophie, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you a date for that because I would literally be making it up because we're in the uh, throes of a global pandemic that is still unpredictable. Now, you talk about economic consequences, and yes, there are economic consequences for everything that we do to try to control the virus. But the point I made earlier is the point I'm going to make again because it's really important. There would also be big economic consequences if we didn't try to control this virus in any way, if we just let it spread in an uncontrolled way. That's the, the really hard fact at the heart of this. You can't escape economic consequences when you're in a global pandemic. The question is, how do you manage all of this in the least damaging and the least harmful way? We have an analysis that we apply to everything we do in the Scottish Government around what we call four harms. We look at the direct harm from uh, COVID, the associated health harms and the economic and social harms. And what we try to do is come to balanced decisions uh, that lead us to the least possible damage and harm. What about, but the what idea, about... and I know after two years why people want to, to believe this, but the idea that we can navigate our way through a pandemic like this with no impact at all, unfortunately, is not the case. What about if we let this virus spread, it would be more deaths, more illness 
and also more damage to the economy. One of the biggest uh, challenges with Omicron, of course, has been staff absences caused by infections. Now, if we had taken no measures to control this, that would have been even worse and therefore businesses would have found about, it even more difficult to continue to trade. What about, masks, what about trade. masks in public places? Because they are staying in place for now. How long do you think that will be? Can you envisage people having to wear masks in public places for, for months or years to come? Uh, look, I hope not. Uh, I don't want any of these measures to be in place for any longer than is necessary. But masks and, you know, there is very good international evidence on this. Masks are something we can do. No, none of us enjoy wearing them, but they are uh, perhaps not the, the biggest uh, handicap uh, to, to endure in order to try to stem transmission. So while they can make a difference to controlling the virus, then I think it is something that we should do. And again, I would suggest that it is England that is the outlier here, not Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, or many countries across the world. Can I just say one other thing here? Nobody likes these measures, but, you know, an opinion poll, and I accept that opinion polls are just that, but an opinion poll in Scotland on Friday showed that two thirds uh, of people in Scotland thought that we had taken the right approach um, in these balanced measures. People don't want to be living in a pandemic, but people understand that in order to protect ourselves, to protect each other, to protect our society as a whole and, and show that solidarity that has served us very well here in Scotland, Doing things like wearing face coverings is perhaps a small price to pay you said, to you keep said, other people safe you said last, and, and also you, to allow the most clinically vulnerable you to said continue last to, week, to live something like a normal life. You said last week that Scotland, you Sorry. hoped, was turning a corner on Omicron. You promised that once mm. Scotland came out of the COVID crisis, you would table the legislation for a referendum on independence. When are you going to do that? At the preparatory work of that is underway right now. We haven't decided on the date that we would seek to introduce the bill. Uh, we'll decide that in the, the coming weeks. Uh, but what I have said, and I will happily say again to you right now, uh, that my uh, intention is to uh, take the steps that will facilitate a referendum happening uh, before the end of 2023. That's the proposition that uh, just short of a year ago uh, I fought an election on and was re-elected as First Minister. My party was re-elected with a historically high share of the vote. This is about democracy. It's about allowing the people of Scotland to choose our own future. Um, and for goodness sake, when we look at everything that is happening, has been happening over uh, years now in Westminster, the chaos, the instability, the unpredictability, uh, then I think there are a growing number of people in Scotland who think actually we could do much better uh, as an independent country in charge of our own fate people rather also than want having to, people like people Boris Johnson People also want to know us. when you are going to table this legislation. And in 2017, you you said autumn 2018 was the common sense time for another referendum. In autumn 18, you said you'd set out your plans for an independence referendum in the not too distant future. In autumn 2019, you said the referendum must happen next year. In autumn 2020, you said you wouldn't rule out a vote in 2021. And in 2021, you said you'd start pushing for a referendum in spring 2022. When is going to be the right time? Look, I make no apology for the fact that over the past two years as First Minister, I have prioritised steering the country through a pandemic. At the outset of the pandemic, I very clearly said we were putting plans for an independence referendum on hold. If only Boris Johnson had done likewise with plans uh, around Brexit, we wouldn't be seeing some of the chaos associated with Brexit right now. But I am determined, I've won an election on this basis, to give people in Scotland uh, the choice over our future. And I, I believe when that choice comes, people will choose an independent future. The preparatory work for that is underway and will determine uh, the precise date for introducing that legislation in due course. Uh, we are uh, hopefully, as you said earlier on, as I said earlier on, on the downward slope of this wave of Omicron, which clears uh, the way for us to do that. The key thing is that we will take these steps uh, in a time scale that will facilitate that referendum before the end of 2023, given, which given, is the commitment I made at the election and was elected on overwhelmingly. Given, given the that election. Boris Johnson's approval ratings are at rock bottom right now and support for Scottish independence is still only around 50%. If that doesn't drive support for independence, <laughs> what will? 
Look, uh, Sophie, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm laughing not at the question. I'm just laughing, at reflecting the fact that if you told me when I was a much younger uh, politician uh, that one day 50% support for independence would be seen as some kind of failure, I would have uh, grabbed that with both hands. Look, support for independence, I believe, is rising. I think when Scotland comes to choose, we will choose independence, not just because uh, of the current occupant in number 10, but what that is illustrating very powerfully is the fact that Scotland too often ends up uh, with things imposed upon us, Brexit, for example, or being governed uh, by people and by parties that we don't choose. And all of that is the price of not being independent. Being independent is not some magic wand that takes away all challenges that we will face, but it puts our destiny, our fate, our future in okay. our own hands. Well, we'll uh, have to talk about that. That's the beauty and the essence of independence. And I believe that's what people in Scotland will choose when they get the opportunity. Plenty more to discuss. I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk that another time. But for now, thank you very much, Nicola Sturgeon. That is all from me. Thank you for watching. We will be back next Sunday. Goodbye.